Norman Otto Heipel dies in 1953. He leaves behind a lumber and manufacturing empire. More than 50 years later, a legal war is launched over his legacy. I knew what the word destitute meant at 15 years of age, I can assure you. I will never forget what I saw my mother go through, ever. It's a David and Goliath story that pits the family of his impoverished daughter, Norma, against her wealthy brother, George's estate and a Canadian giant. When people find you're gonna take on a bank, um, they give you looks of acute sympathy, <laughs> or they say, you are nuts. Making a case of conspiracy against anyone is quite difficult. What this loss has cost this family is obscene. May 8, 2004, at the age of 84, Norma Jakes collapses. It's a stroke, and it will set off a chain of events that unearth extraordinary revelations about her past. Barbara Watson is one of Norma's seven children. I picked up the phone, and I heard my mother's voice, and I instantly knew she was in trouble. And I knew she'd stroked. I just knew it. Norma needs round-the-clock care. Her eldest daughter, Barbara's sister, Nancy Dacent, cleans the condo to make room for nursing support and digs up an astonishing family secret. I opened an envelope and took out an original newspaper article that I realized virtually immediately was an obituary, and it was an obituary of our grandfather. Their grandfather is Norman Otto Heipel, a blank spot in the family history. His obituary tells a tale Nancy and Barbara have never heard, and it calls into question every aspect of their lineage. In the late 1960s, Norma lives in a remote Ontario town with her husband, David Jakes, and their seven children, including Nancy and Barbara, it is a life of abject poverty. I knew what the word destitute meant at 15 years of age, I can assure you. I knew what extreme poverty meant. Food, I, I can remember being hungry. There were no amenities at all, there were no extras. Uh, we literally did struggle from day to day to simply survive. I can't make it any more clear than that. Growing up, the Jakes children know little about their mother's side of the family, the Hypels. They have more pressing concerns. When you are focused on survival and behind you there are six other brothers and sisters, you are not searching for your roots. Only decades later, when Nancy discovers her grandfather's obituary, will the Hypels' startling history come to light. This extraordinary description of this man. It was a total shock. On February 16, 1953, Norman Otto Heipel dies of a heart attack. He's risen from the shanty where he was born to be founder and president of N.O. Heipel Limited, a massive lumber and manufacturing firm that builds barns and arenas all over Canada. In Preston, Ontario, where he lives, Norman Otto Heipel is known affectionately as N.O. N.O. is elected mayor of Preston and soon wins a seat in Ontario's provincial parliament, where he serves as Speaker of the House and as representative at the coronation of King George VI. This man who developed this extraordinary business from nothing by sheer work and intelligence and grit and determination was my grandfather. N.O. Heifel is a self-made man and a family man. He and his wife, Olive, have two children, a son, George, and six years later, a daughter, Norma, who shares the same passion for hockey as her father. By the time of his death at age 62, N.O. Heifel is a leading industrialist and politician at the pinnacle of his career. He leaves behind N.O. Heifel Limited, one of the largest companies of its kind, of which he is president and 88% shareholder. All this comes as a great surprise to his grandchildren, including Barbara and Nancy's brother, Barry Jakes. It was amazing uh, what he had accomplished and the kind of person that he was. 
I wish I'd have known him. It was a shock on a number of levels to hear for the first time that your grandfather was a minister in the government and an accomplished man as well and had done so much in his life. I mean, it was a shock, but the other part of that equation is that's your heritage, that's, those are your roots, that's where you come from. Beyond pride, there's confusion. The siblings can't reconcile the poverty they knew growing up with this account of a well-to-do grandfather. I was very, very sad for, for what my mother had had to go through uh, her whole life, and us children too, for the, the opportunities that we could have had that we didn't have. After I digested the contents of that obituary, I contacted my lawyer in Calgary and I asked him if there was any possible way that a will from 1953 could be retrieved. In June of 2004, Norman Otto Heipel's will is recovered from the archives of Ontario. Its contents leave Nancy dumbfounded. I was reading a document that clearly said that my grandfather's entire estate was to be held in trust all of my grandmother was to get a life interest and that at her death, his entire estate was to be divided equally between my mother and George. Their uncle George Heipel is another unknown quantity. George and Norma have been estranged since 1962 and he lives more than 2,000 miles away. Nancy then asks to have her grandmother Olive's will recovered. Grandmother's will arrived about a week later and second shock like her husband, Olive wants her estate split 50-50 between her children, George and Norma. We have two inheritances here. They were to be divided equally between George and mother. My mother did not receive either one of those inheritances. This did not occur, not with just one estate, but two estates. So 25 years after Grandpa died, mother should have inherited half of her mother's estate and she should have been beneficiary to half of her father's estate. So you can imagine the shock. I'm sure Nancy just sat there with her mouth open for 10 minutes. Nancy and her lawyers are left to wonder, did George Heipel inherit both estates? There's also the question of what happened to the company, N.O. Heipel Limited. N.O.'s will says all his assets are to be split equally between George and Norma. I did not see a sentence that said, George Heipel inherited Anno Hypo Limited from his father. Anno Hypo Limited did not belong to George Hypo. It was at that moment that she realized that our mother was to inherit half of her father's company. That was a pretty big shock. That was, you know, the sucker punch to, to the gut, as they say. In 1953, hundreds of people attend Anno Hypo's funeral. For the moment, the family stands united in grief. But that will change. Glenna Cross was Olive's neighbor for 15 years. She used to come and have coffee with me just about every other day. And she was um, very, very reclusive, had no friends, not a happy lady. One person brings Olive out of her depression, her son, George Heipel. George when he came to see her, she, it was like somebody brought out a shining star. She would light up. That was the time when I would see her the happiest. She just absolutely idolized him. And she would do anything he said was absolutely wonderful, and it was law. In 15 years, Glenna never meets Norma. Olive doesn't say why. I knew there was a problem with her daughter, but she never ever verbalized it to me as to what the problem was. Growing up, Norma and George are not at odds, but they have separate friends and lives. So what happens to sour their relationship? From her perspective, her relationship, she felt was very good. There was a six year age difference between these two children, so their worlds didn't actually cross. The source of the family split is believed to be in 1950, when Norma marries David Jakes. The union may have raised a few eyebrows. It wasn't just that my father was Catholic, it, it was worse. He was a French Canadian, Catholic in a German Protestant town. Like many small towns of the era, Preston in the 1950s is divided along religious lines. 
Back in the 1950s when I attended the um, Protestant school, it was right across the road from the Catholic school. And it was kind of an unwritten law that the Protestants walked on their side of the street and the Catholics walked on their side of the street. We didn't venture across. Norma's marriage to David Jakes is held in a side room of the Catholic Church because Norma is Protestant. George and his mother uh, did not like my father at all because he was French and he was Catholic and he was poor. And so when my grandfather passed away, um, that's when uh, the problems for my, my father began. Without N.O. Heipel to keep the peace, Norma and David Jakes leave Preston. They buy a small home and store in the remote town of Macy's Bay. They sell gas and groceries to support their growing family. The kids pitch in as soon as they're able. I actually enjoyed working in the store. Um, everybody in my family, all of the children uh, participated in running the store. We didn't have any hired help. And uh, I was seven and, uh, you know, I, I started helping out as soon as, as soon as we moved. Well, I have two sets of memories. It's kind of like one life and then another life. Life in Macy's Bay is fine for a while, but in August 1966, the family suffers a tragedy from which it will take decades to recover. I had no idea there was anything wrong until this gentleman ran in the store. I needed him to let go of me so that I could go into the house to retrieve the cash deposits from the store, which I knew was the only money that we actually had. And he was screaming at me, not because he was upset, but so that I could hear him over my screams that the building was on fire. We had gas tanks where we sold um, gasoline and oil as part of our general store in the business. And I was well aware that those tanks could blow. And I remember seeing my father running frantically, trying to find out where his children were. When I got to the edge of the property and stopped, and turned around, the building exploded. The building was gone in 15 minutes. The tragedy leaves the Jakes family destitute, but the worst is yet to come. George was very busy making money. George was very busy taking money. The blaze consumes the family's material possessions, and it takes an emotional toll, especially on Norma and her husband, David. My father was having a complete and total breakdown in the cottage in which we were staying. My mother was in shock. My mother was literally numb. I remember thinking, thank God I didn't lose my glasses. I remember thinking, I have one shoe. I remember thinking, how are we going to eat? Where are we going to live? The children helped to rebuild the store. It's a race against the coming winter. It was hard. Uh, we worked like slaves. I mean, we had nothing. I mean, stop and think about this. Uh, family of nine, seven children to feed, clothe, and shelter. And not only does your house burn down, your entire source of income is gone as well. And I know that my parents didn't have adequate insurance to, to, to deal with the situation. And we were destitute. And um, from that point forward, we just worked 16 hours a day, seven days a week. Left homeless, the family splits up in borrowed accommodations. There was no electricity. It was kerosene lamp. There was a wood stove for heat. We had no bathroom. We had no way of having a shower. I had a shower at school in gym class. We lived on Georgian Bay. Winter sets in early on Georgian Bay. My father worked during the day uh, to rebuild this concrete structure, and we worked at night. I will never forget what I went through and what I saw my mother go through, ever. News of the fire reaches Preston. In a rare visit, Norma's mother, Olive Heipel, arrives with a carload of clothes for the children. My understanding is my grandmother came up to Macy's Bay with clothing for the family. I don't remember that happening. I don't, I don't have any recollection of that at all. 
which I have one memory of my grandma Hypo arriving sometime after the fire, but I, I, I couldn't tell you how many weeks or maybe even months it was. I didn't know who she was. I didn't sense any affection. And that's not to fault my grandma. I mean, there was a lot going on. Mrs. Heipel had told me that they'd had a fire um, at their place, and she did leave for a day. Norma's brother George is conspicuously absent. He's busy running his father's company, N.O. Hypo Limited. Back in 1953, Ontario, women were not involved in business or finance, period. And it was par for the course for the, a man's son to inherit his business from him. That was just the standard procedure. And, and when my grandfather died, my mother, along with everybody else that was involved in my grandfather's businesses and in the community, just understood that George inherited the company. George does not visit his sister. He sends Norma money, not as a gift, but as a loan. He made a very strong point of, I'm not going to give my sister a damn cent. The interesting thing about George Heupel, as we now understand with such clarity, is that George Heupel believed in three things. George Heupel, money, and golf. Norma's husband, David Jakes, grows resentful. I don't believe my father ever recovered from losing everything that he'd worked so hard to achieve and to have. After that, my father was like a broken man. Much of their father's anger is directed towards George Heupel. The children learn never to mention the Heupel name as it triggers David Jake's rage. My father was mentally ill. Uh, he had what they refer to now as anger management problems. He was a very angry man, and he would go into these tirades about George Heupel. And as a young child growing up, we heard that, but we didn't know if it was true or not. It was just my dad off on another tirade, and he, he would be plenty angry. I mean, he really had a bee in his bonnet. Um, so we knew there was great animosity there. The Hypo name was not allowed to be discussed in our household. My father would just go into a, uh, fits of rage when anything was discussed concerning the Hypo family. So it just was never discussed, period. March 15, 1978, 25 years after the death of her husband, N.O., Olive Heipel dies of a stroke at age 88. Norma hears the news from Harry Willoughby, her brother's longtime secretary. Harry invites Norma to the service, but says there's nothing in the will for her. This phone call sets off David Jakes in another tirade against George Heipel, but this time it turns dangerously violent. He felt that there should be something of significance coming to my mother from her mother's estate. And um, he was enraged when that wasn't the case. He started to beat her, and she was fearful for her life. By this time, Nancy and Barry are adults. When they hear what happened, they make sure it's the last time their father beats their mother. Nancy said, Barry, we have to go up right now and get mom and uh, our other siblings, Mary, Martin, and David, and get them out of the home. Uh, Dad is beating Mom, and she's afraid he's going to kill her. And so that, you know, within, I don't know, an hour of that phone call from my mother, uh, uh, we went up there and we removed them from the family home. In July 1978, Nancy and Norma move across the country to Calgary, Alberta. The goal is to start new lives from scratch. But Nancy believes the distance made it easier for George to keep his sister in the dark about her inheritances. Unbeknownst to me, every decision I made and made after that allowed George Heipel to steal every cent of my mother's inheritance. We got on the plane the first week of July to fly to Alberta, and he walked out of a courtroom fully in control of grandmother's estate. As sole executor of Olive's estate, George employs a lawyer to probate the will. George is supposed to divvy up the estate, but he doesn't. And he literally walked away with it. Literally and figuratively walked away with it. At that point in my mom's life in 1978, the inheritance would have made a huge difference in her life. It would have enabled her uh, to move to Calgary, buy a home, buy a car, get herself set up, 
and then look for work and, and, and be comfortable uh, with her life. And when she moved out to Alberta, to Calgary, she had next to nothing. The reality of my family's life would have been completely different if my mother had received her legacy. In June 2004, Nancy and her siblings tell their mother Norma about both of her missing inheritances. It has been 51 years since her father's death and 26 years since her mother's. She is 84 years old. We were incredibly afraid of what the shock of reading his wills would do to her. She was struggling so hard to overcome the effects of his stroke. And when we, I finished reading my grandfather's will to her, she shook her head and she, she said, well, where's the company? Where's the company? Well, for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, she didn't understand why George would take her inheritance. Her body's already been deeply shocked and then she gets second shock and then third shock because she lost from her father and she lost from her mother. So she's had three whammies in five months. They discuss their options. George is still alive in Preston, but they don't want to approach him until they've hired a lawyer familiar with Ontario trust and estate law. It would be incredibly dangerous to go near George Heupel, to even contact him. Until we had legal counsel in place, we had no idea what the circumstance was in Waterloo County at all. In June 2004, Norma decides to launch two separate lawsuits, one for each missing inheritance. When we all had conversed at great length about this injustice, we all were on the same page, all of the siblings, that someone needed to be held accountable. Nancy said, Mom, we can do this for you. Uh, I will do, we will do a power of attorney so that the stress uh, for you is minimized substantially. And she said, yes, yes, yes. Norma's resolve ignites hope, but this could be destroyed with news of another blaze. This one, highly suspicious. Dad had always uh, ex suspected that the fire was sort of suspicious. In his will, Norma's father, N.O. Heipel, names a company called Waterloo Trust as co-executor of his estate. In the 60s, Waterloo Trust is acquired by Canada Trust, now a division of Canadian banking giant Toronto Dominion. When people find you're going to take on a bank, um, they give you looks of acute sympathy, <laughs> or they say, you are nuts. But if we didn't take on this institution to right this wrong, who's going to do it? The difficulty in uh, locating a lawyer was the conflict of interest that so many law firms in Toronto had with TD Canada Trust. They had done work with them in the past, they were working with them with the present. They simply could not help or assist us with our lawsuit. While they search for legal counsel, the family keeps quiet about their pending lawsuit. Then, in November 2004, Norma hires David M. Smith, a partner with Holland Hull, an estate litigation firm in Toronto. Working with David Smith was actually a pleasure. He believed in us. He believed our story. That was huge. That was absolutely huge. Coming from the background that we came from, to have someone say, I believe you, was 50% of the battle. They are ready to move forward, but George never learns about the pending lawsuit. One month after hiring David Smith, George Heipel dies. He's 90 years old, still a wealthy man. His motives die with him, so the family never hears his side of the story. In early 2005, Norma files suit against George's estate for her share of her mother's estate. She files a second suit against Canada Trust for her share of her father's estate. We ended up with two lawsuits. George Hypo had obviously been unjustly enriched by whatever debacle had occurred with grandfather's estate. But George Hypo's estate also owed money to mother because of her missing inheritance from her mother. George leaves a handsome home in Preston. His wife Mabel is dead and he has no children. So his three main beneficiaries are acquaintances and colleagues who also happen to be his estate executors, his lawyer, his accountant, and his golf course manager. 
We were very concerned. I was very concerned that his assets would be dispersed to the beneficiaries of his estate, and then we, in turn, would be in a very difficult position of recovering those assets because we did not know what he owned at his death. We did not know how much wealth there was. To avoid a conflict of interest, Scotia Trust, a neutral party, is appointed as executor in their place. Now the family can focus on gathering evidence to fight two legal battles. They believe the estates could be worth several million dollars, but they don't know for sure. Nancy reaches out to long-lost relatives in Ontario for help. Tracy Heipel's father, Jack, was N.O. Heipel's nephew and driver. My father was, was very close to N.O. to, to the point where I, I think that George was, uh, didn't like the fact that he was closer to N.O. than basically he was to his own dad. Gordon Heipel is N.O.'s nephew. His father, Arthur, ran company operations and was a shareholder in N.O. Heipel Limited. There were originally five shareholders in the business to make it a limited company. And uh, my dad owned 14 shares, uh, common shares. And uh, at that time, back in 1927, 28, those shares were worth uh, $10 each, which at that time was a fair amount of money. Gordon and Tracy have insight into George Heipel to offer Norma's family. George seemed to always want friendship, but the only way he could get friendship was he would buy people stuff or, or do stuff to get people to like him. George wasn't a friendly person. He could walk and almost touch you and never even say hi to you. And I think George probably took a little more to his mother's side. Through these newfound allies, Nancy learns her mother is not the only family member duped by George. After Eno's death, George took the helm of the company. Gordon's father was laid off, then told his shares in the company were worthless. George told him that he was 65, he was retired, and uh, there was no pension. And uh, my dad asked about the shares, and he said the shares were worthless and uh, that was the end of it. Nancy also learned startling news about the company, N.O. Hypo Limited, from Tracy Hypo. And I said, you know, it was really too bad that the, uh, the fire had destroyed basically the business. And, and her response was right away was, what fire are you talking about? And I said, well, the, the fire that had basically engulfed the company and then soon after that, it, it was dissolved. In the mid-60s, a series of three suspicious fires destroy all but one building belonging to N.O. Hypo Limited. In fact, there were three fires there. I remember the big fire, yes. I was working in Guelph at the time, and uh, on my way home from work, I spotted the glow in the sky and uh, went down, and of course, the closer I got to the shop, uh, I could tell exactly where it was. It was a big company. It employed a lot of people. Um, I mean, I knew the people. My dad worked in a building just down the street from him, from the Hypo company. So when it burnt down, it was pretty devastating for a lot of people. As many as 5,000 spectators watched the third and largest blaze. In news reports, George points the finger at a so-called firebug, but around town, people have their own suspicions. Dad had always suspected a, a, a certain individual that George might have used to do it. The word I heard was that, that they were pretty sure it was set, but nobody could prove anything. That was the unfortunate part of it. The first two fires destroy the offices and showroom of N.O. Hypo Limited. The third destroys the company's assets and records. The land was sold and uh, apartment buildings were put up on that land. And uh, a strange thing that uh, Harry Willoughby developed a pension up until he retired, but uh, with all the years my dad was there, he never received a cent. My dad had always said George really didn't want to run a company that size. He didn't have the uh, 
financial skills or, or managerial skills to run a company like that and basically just wanted to, to get out of the, doing the business. His plan would have been to collect the insurance after the fire and then sell the land and take whatever he could. For now, George's possible motives are mere speculation, but Norma's family is about to uncover incriminating evidence. We knew when we read those letters that we had a solid case against the estate of George Heupel. In June 2005, Norma's lawyer puts 13 requests in front of an Ontario judge. The goal is to obtain all existing records for N.O. Heupel's company and estate. I said to David, this lawsuit is deadly serious. This loss is staggering. What this loss has cost my mother is beyond description. What this loss has cost this family is obscene. After N.O. Heifel's death, his estate is managed by Waterloo Trust, which in the 60s is acquired by Canada Trust. By 2005, Canada Trust is unable to locate estate records. They didn't have a single piece of paper for an estate that they were responsible for for 25 years. Ludicrous. Did they really expect that we would believe that? Did they really think <laughs> that somehow that was going to be sufficient to stop this lawsuit? No. So we wrote orders for everything, and every one of those orders was granted. The family gains access to George's house. They're hoping to find financial records. Tracy Heupel tells Nancy what they can expect to find inside, so they're optimistic George's home office will hold valuable information. We walked into that house fully expecting to see George's office intact. And uh, upon opening the door to go in, uh, the, the shock was that uh, the place had been stripped. Their uh, antiques were, were missing. Uh, all the pictures in the office that related to N.O. that were hung on the walls were gone. My first initial reaction was to pick the phone up and phone the police. My God, where are the contents of this home? Then I walked into the office, empty shelves, empty filing cabinets, empty drawers. We walked into that office and we just stopped dead in our tracks and literally our jaws fell to the floor and we were heartbroken. We knew at that moment this was going to be an uphill battle. Two of George's executors, his lawyer and his accountant, later admit they removed contents from the home, but other people had house keys as well, so it's not entirely clear exactly who took what or when. George's executors testified under oath that they threw out a great deal of the contents of that house. It's a huge setback, but in the next few days, the court appointed executors for George's estate allow the family to view crucial documents. Meeting minutes for N.O. Hypo Limited in the years following his death, share certificates, and the company ledger. The paper trail shows how George assumes control of the company. Since Norma is not present at any of the meetings, the family's lawyer argues this shows negligence on the part of Waterloo Trust. Another key discovery comes days later. They learn key documents from George's house are being stored in a Kitchener law firm including letters written back and forth between George Heipel and his secretary, Harry Willoughby. It was very obvious from the correspondence that George Heipel had cr created this persona around my father of a lazy, ne'er-do-well. In other words, mother was responsible because she married this man that George despised and talked about in such derogatory terms. What they find is damning. And the correspondence clearly paints George Heupel and Harry Willoughby trying to figure out how to ensure Mother never saw the will, how to ensure that she never knew what Grandmother's estate was actually worth, how to ensure that she never really understood what she was actually entitled to. We knew when we read those letters that we had a solid case against the estate of George Heupel. The family is confident they can prove George stole his mother's estate from under the nose of his sister. But to pursue Canada Trust in the second lawsuit, they need money. They use the new evidence to push for a settlement with George's beneficiaries. In April 2008, Toronto mediator Brian Schnur is brought in. The day of the settlement of my uncle George's estate, 
There was a mediation lawyer came in and he told us that we had today to come to a settlement. And if we didn't reach a settlement, we would end up going to court uh, many years down the road. And it was most likely that the legal uh, fees and expenses would take away all of the money that was left in the estate. After a grueling negotiation, the two sides reach an agreement. George's estate, valued at more than $1.1 million, is to pay Norma $300,000 plus $50,000 from his late wife's estate. Norma will take possession of George's Preston home, valued at nearly $400,000. We were, we were very pleased with uh, how it ended. There was, without a shadow of a doubt, evidence to prove that this man stole mother's inheritance from her mother, full stop. The bank was a completely different story. Having reached a settlement with George Heipel's estate, the family can focus on a single lawsuit against Canada Trust. They accuse the trust company of breaching its fiduciary duty, claiming Norma was never told about her inheritance. David Friedman is a law professor at Queen's University and a practicing trust and estate lawyer in Ontario. A fiduciary obligation is an obligation that arises on trust and loyalty. It's not just doing your job, but um, looking out for the best interests of the person that you're obligated to. Canada Trust denies any wrongdoing. It calls Norma's case a flimsy construction of speculation, conjecture, inference, and innuendo. I sat there and went, ah, my boys in the Gucci suits are not happy. What have we done to trigger this response? Canada Trust asks to have the case dismissed, but it is not able to produce any records to show it paid money to Norma. In January 2008, Mr. Justice Gerald Taylor rules the case can go to trial. When our case management judge agreed that this case should be heard at trial, we were euphoric. You know, my mother's a very simple woman, and she has said many times, uh, I didn't get my inheritance, I'm telling you the truth. And that validated my mother. Uh, in a very large way. With a trial looming, new evidence casts further doubt on George's character, but is it enough to implicate Canada Trust? I believe they're trying to run Nancy and her mom, I mean, out of money, because how do you, how do you fight a bank with, with endless pockets? I mean... It's a victory for Norma, but her family's legal costs are mounting. The cash from the settlement helps, but it's not enough. To save money, the family takes on the bulk of the investigative work themselves. We met up with our brother Barry in Toronto, and we would hit the archives, we hit the land title offices, we hit museums, we hit multiple newspaper offices, we hit libraries. I was a regular up at the uh, land title searches uh, building up in, in Kitchener. I would spend basically from the time it opened to almost the time it closed doing property searches through through Microfish for them every, every Friday. And this went on for, for months at a time. Their investigation uncovers valuable evidence. They find promissory notes, bank loans, and mortgages taken out against the company, showing George is driving the company deeper and deeper into debt. He mortgaged the key assets of the company. He mortgaged the sawmill. He mortgaged the manufacturing plant. He had his hands on the equivalent of millions of dollars of cash. And they recovered the fire marshal's accounts of the fires that burned the company, NO Hypo Limited. That was one of the most fascinating pieces of material that I've ever read in all the material uncovered in this lawsuit. According to the fire marshal's report, the company was on the brink of an audit. And within two to three days, at the most of being told he was going to be audited, the office burnt to the ground. Well, the office burnt to the ground. In, in December 1964, the inventory sheets are gone and destroyed. We can't help you with your audit. The fire marshal remarks on the convenient timing of the fires, and he even implicates George Heipel and Harry Willoughby by name, stating that a failing business has been liquidated in the most financially advantageous manner possible. When I read that sentence, I actually laughed out loud. He was absolutely right. 
George had systematically, intentionally, and knowingly destroyed that company, step by step, year by year. Three months after Norma's 89th birthday, the trial with Canada Trust begins in Ontario Superior Court. The plaintiffs have an independent business valuation that suggests Norma's share of her father's estate could be as much as $12.5 million before punitive damages. They seemed very optimistic that everything was, was going their way. And At one level, this was a great adventure. It really was a great adventure, and we threw ourselves into it wholeheartedly. The trial, held in December 2009 and January 2010, is 17 days long. It's full of drama. In his opening address, the lawyer for Canada Trust says there's circumstantial evidence to show Norma actually got her inheritance in 1966, after the store burnt down. It looks like she came into some money in the 60s, and perhaps that was um, in a release for certain rights she had in her father's estate. The bank suggested that my mother more than likely received her inheritance after our store burned down because after all, we were obviously able to rebuild. Norma's son Barry Jakes disputes that theory when he's questioned by Canada Trust lawyer. Uh, I remember that very clearly. He asked me something to the effect of, well, how did you know that you were that poor or that badly off? And I said, well, when you're sitting on a school bus year after year after year after year, and you're wearing the clothes from the person sitting beside you, uh, you know you're poor. Uh, I said, when uh, you're uh, 11, 12 years old, and you're involved in heavy, heavy physical labor, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, you know you're poor. And when you use a five-gallon pail for a toilet, year after year after year, half of the time, you know that you're poor. It was as simple as that. That's the three things that I said to him. The family may have earned the court's sympathies, but the trial is anybody's game. Canada Trust admits under oath to having lost all of its documents related to the Hypo file, except for a single divider. They had no records behind that file divider or in front of that file divider, but they had the file divider. But the trust company argues it wasn't obligated to keep its files. Here, the bank's position is, we don't have records, and that's not because we were neglectful, it's because that was the practice at the time. And so there's nothing you know, fraudulent or deceitful or wrong about that. Much of the family's evidence is admissible, but much isn't. They can't enter statements made in the fire marshal's report into evidence. Unless the fire marshal can be called as a witness, it's hearsay. It was a difficult case because the witnesses that really could provide um, the best evidence had all died. Then Canada Trust produces two deeds of sale for N.O. Heifel's properties. The first is for his farm, sold by the estate in 1955, and the second is for his summer residence, sold in 1956. Norma's signature is on both deeds, and one of them lists her as a co-beneficiary of her father's estate. Their point um, in leading that evidence is, if she was asked to sign that paper to facilitate a transaction for the purposes of the estate, she both knew that her father had passed away, knew that there was a will, and knew that she would have some sort of interest in that estate. So supposedly, from the bank's point of view, that means she knew about her inheritance and didn't do anything about it. Our response is, Mother's signature is on two deeds. So? My mom doesn't remember signing those documents. I don't think it would be very difficult to get her signature on any kind of a document in 1954 or 1955, to be quite honest with you. In January 2010, the court is adjourned. Both parties will have to wait more than a year before the judge reaches a decision. It's a long, long time to wait. And, uh, you know, a lot hinging on it. The wait for the ruling was in one word, brutal. Finally, in September 2011, the judge issues his ruling by fax. It was quite surprising because it is the first time I've ever read a ruling where both sides are winning and losing. The Honorable Michael Dale Perieski sides with Norma and concludes she never received her share of the inheritance and Canada Trust is liable. Now, that had been the fight all along. And that was the victory that we had to win.
she did not get her inheritance and the bank was responsible. But the judge sides with the trust company's argument that Norma ought to have known about her entitlement years before. He cites the deeds with Norma's signature as evidence. In other words, mother didn't receive her inheritance. The bank was responsible, but the bank wasn't going to be held accountable. The judge dismisses Norma's claim because she didn't go after the inheritance within six years of her mother Olive's death. Her claim was what the law would call discoverable. If she had taken reasonable steps to discover whether she had a claim, she would have discovered that indeed she does have a claim and that she waited too long and now the limitations period bars her claim being made. And that's quite conventional in civil litigation. Someone may have had a contract with you and breached it 20 years ago. It's too late for you now to sue on that contract. The judge also states what he believes Norma's share of Norman Otto Heifel's estate should be. $500,000. To be honest, I thought that perhaps they made a typing error in the office and it should be reading $5 million instead of $500,000. It is a bitter pill to swallow. I mean, uh, in, in my words, that, that company should still be running today. It should be a family-run company and it was destroyed. Well, it has been all-consuming for my family for the last eight years. This has been our life. Um, the financial sacrifices for my siblings and I have been staggering. Everything in our lives has been put on hold for eight years. It has cost me everything that I own. It has cost me my marriage. Uh, I sit here at 60 years of age uh, with debt and no security, no pension and no assets in terms of the material sense of the word. Now, it, it seems shocking to people and, and it seems very unfair that someone can get out of liability just because you've taken too long to bring your claim. And that's a feature of our civil litigation system. You know, it's, uh, it's unfortunate that the law is not oriented to give people justice. What it's oriented to do is to apply rules fairly. You know, whether going forward, one lesson from this case is that corporate trustees should be keeping records forever and giving advances in uh, information technology that probably isn't going to be too difficult. You know, that may be the, the, the lesson that the rest of us can take. At age 91, Norma Jakes has appealed part of the decision pertaining to the limitation period. Her children insist it's not about the money, but the legacy they leave their own children. This trust company needs to understand and realize what drives this family. They do not understand what drives me and why we are still standing and why we are here seven years later fighting an appeal based on principle. Why can't a corporation own their responsibility? Do they feel good about this? That's the question. I feel good at night. I'm proud that my daughters and my nieces and nephews have seen us do this. That's the legacy I leave for my children. Maybe we won't recover financially, but I'm incredibly proud of my siblings and the legacy that we've left these great-grandchildren would be the legacy my grandfather would want left. I can assure you, 